It's a piece of barren ground about eight miles from where I live near Denver, Colorado. Rocky Flats. Very rocky, not quite as flat as it sounds. A little bit hilly. Just enough hills there to where it almost hides that innocent looking place. Office buildings, laboratory buildings, factory buildings. Smokestack, a water tower. Looks almost like an Iowa town. People work there, friendly people, intelligent people, educated people, beautiful people, innocent people. Innocent people go there daily to feed a demon. Tomorrow's Holocaust is being nurtured at Rocky Flats. All the little trigger bombs in the U.S. arsenal, those small bombs that we dropped on Hiroshima, which are now the trigger bombs for the big bomb, the H-bomb. Every one in the U.S. arsenal is being born and nursed into life at Rocky Flats. Three a day. Friendly people, intelligent people, beautiful people, people like you and I. No more accurately, it is you and I. It is you and I who are nurturing and birthing these demons. We are the people. We are the people who are feeding, stoking the fires of the future Holocaust. We are the builders of the bomb. We are the thinkers, the designers, the planners, and particularly the buyers of the bomb. It is our money. It is our minds. It is our fears. It is our mythology. It is our faith which is building those bombs. Where is that coming from? Who are we anyway? Who are we and who do we think are those human brothers and sisters out there for whom we are building those bombs? And who keeps telling us to build and build and build? thousands of buckets of Kool-Aid. Who is the Jimmy Jones of Rocky Flats? And why do we keep listening to him? Or is he in all of us? For some of us, living in the backyard or the front yard of Rocky Flats, the nuclear crossroads of America has become a symbol and a mirror of some moral crossroads. I'm speaking now symbolically that Rocky Flats is everywhere Rocky Flats is in Iowa as well as in Colorado. Rocky Flats is a state of mind. It's a state of being. Rocky Flats is a moral crisis, a 
moral crossroads. There are a number of ways of understanding and looking at the issues, the moral issues involved in Rocky Flats and all that it represents. One way is to even ask the question, are we seeing? Are we even aware that Rocky Flats is there? For some of us who live near Rocky Flats, it took some years of being there to kind of see what was happening there. It was in 1952 that the plant was established. Basically under a sort of mysterious secrecy, not quite being public with what was happening there. Gradually, news came out a little bit more of what's happening there. There are still people in the Denver area who do not know what is being produced at Rocky Flats. The first moral question is one of seeing. Do we have eyes to see? There are people who are saying we ought to move Rocky Flats. It's a health hazard, the possibility of leakage. And there have been some minor leaks of plutonium in fires at the plant. Makes it mandatory that the plant should be moved. Make it safe by moving it away. Increase the uh, sanitation precautions, increase the safety precautions. And the moral question, is that the answer? And part of me says, yes, 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 move it. Move it away from the possibility of an accident which may endanger the lives of thousands of people. And part of me says, no. No, no, if we move it out of sight, move it into the uh, desert, then we will even be less prone to see the demon that we are producing to be aware of it. I'm reminded of the story that Jesus told about the people who were uh, eating in this outdoor restaurant and uh, along comes a gnat and gets into the soup and you strain out the gnat. Don't want that little nasty gnat in the soup. And along comes a camel, plops into the soup bowl and he swallowed a whole camel. Now it seems to me that that's what we're doing with uh, wanting to put Rocky Flats out of sight, wanting to make sure we filter out all the possible little leaks and then keep nurturing and nursing the demon first moral issue then is one of whether we really want to see what we are doing and see in the sense of being aware of, and knowing, thinking about. A second moral question is, can we speak? Can we speak out? Or have we become so accustomed to the mythologies which are being promoted around us that we have become silenced. Is our capacity for moral sensitivity and moral passion so dulled that uh, we can no longer say a small two-letter word, no, no, 
No! And keep saying it. And then there comes another moral question. How long can we say no with our words and uh, not say no with our lives and with our resources and with our bodies? And for us close to Rocky Flats, it became uncomfortable to keep writing and speaking only. And sometimes the call to say no with our bodies leads us to the railroad tracks which feed the plant or the access roads and leads us to what our society calls trespass, and that raises another moral question. When will we, who begin to see and begin to speak and begin to put our bodies on the line, also begin to redefine some terms? When will we understand that from the perspective of the creator of life, Rocky Flats and all of the Rocky Flats that are symbolized in Rocky Flats is a horrendous, horrendous trespassing. When will people of conscience, people of faith, have the, the courage and the freedom to redefine our own sense of what is trespassing and stand in the courts, clog the courts, fill the courts and say in many different ways, we are not the trespassers. There is trespass happening. Another moral question is the question of freedom. We have in this society a beautiful measure of freedom to speak. And that is a beautiful freedom. Are we aware of the dilemma that puts us in at the point of integrity? How long can we speak words and be seduced by those who like to keep saying to us, what a beautiful freedom we have to speak. Keep seduced into uh, inaction that is integral to our words. We are now in a moral crossroads where when we speak the truth and don't act, we are praised and lauded and uh, uh, the perpetrators, perpetrators of mythologies keep uh, patting themselves and us on the back and saying, yes, this is why we have the bombs, so that you can speak the truth, so that you have the freedom to speak. When are we going to wake up and know that when we begin to act, in consonance with our words, the law comes down. 
And the time is here when we must face the moral issue of uh, putting integrity into our words with our lives and confronting the powers There are other ways in which that freedom becomes a moral crisis. The arresting officers, the marshals who arrest us, the judges who try us, all say in different words and in different ways when we ask them, what do you think of Rocky Flats? What do you think should happen with Rocky Flats? They say, that is not my responsibility. Or ask me sometime when I'm not in uniform. Or I am here to uphold the law. That is not the question. And maybe we are all caught in that question of being functionaries, being professionals who do our segment, do our bit of keeping the system which perpetuates the mythologies going. When are we as preachers, when are you and we as students and professors when are we going to come more to terms with our response ability, our ability to respond to the moral issues involved in the militarism and bomb production? Most basically, Rocky Flats and all that it represents poses for us all the question of our faith. What do we believe? Where is security to be found? The mythology to which most of us are captive is profound. Greek ancient mythologies are child's play in comparison to the mythologies which are the foundation for our contemporary arms race. Mythologies about power, about security, about what it means to be human, about what it means to find life. I'd like to share an ancient story which is very contemporary, a story which is very much in the past and very much in the present a story of yesterday and today and tomorrow. God is creating the heavens and the earth. The earth is in chaos and wanting for love. There is darkness on the face of the earth and the spirit of God is moving in the darkness. And God is saying, let there be light and there is light, and the light is good. And God is saying, let there be life, and there is life, and the life is good. And God is saying, let there be humanity to reflect my love. And God is forming man out of the dust of the ground, male and female he is creating them, and breathing into their being his spirit of love. God is forming humanity to reflect his love, and the love is very, 
very good. And then, as sly as a snake and appealing as an apple, satanic power comes saying, go to the center of the garden. Grasp for yourself the fruit from the center of the garden. And the man and the woman place themselves in the center of the garden. And all hell breaks loose in their lives. And all hell breaks loose in their world. And the man and the woman raise Cain. And Cain rises up and murders his brother. And the Lord says to Cain on the six o'clock news, where is your brother? And Cain replies, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Besides, he's not my brother. He's my enemy. And Cain turns his back on the Lord of love. And Cain becomes fearful and fashions a gun for his defense. And the gun becomes the god of Cain, and Cain becomes the son of the gun. And the sons and the daughters of Cain worship their god, saying, Guns are our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And the gun gods multiply and spread through the land, and fear multiplies and spreads through the land. And the sons and the daughters of Cain fashion more gods, gods shaped into tanks and missiles and bombs. And the sons and daughters of Cain sing praises to their gods. These are our gods, O people, who preserve our freedom. These are our gods, O people, who save us from our enemies. And the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air, give proof through the night that our gods are still there. And the God of creation cries out to his children, How can I give you up, O children of mine? How can I bear to see you destroying each other? How can I bear to see you destroying your world, my world? How can I express the passionate heat of my anger toward you? How can I show you the passionate tenderness of my love for you? God of creation says, I am the Lord your God, the God of your creation, the God of your light, the God of your love. Why have you forsaken me and gone after other gods? But the sons and the daughters of Cain do not hear. And the missile gods multiply and spread through the earth, and the bomb gods multiply around the world and fear multiplies and spreads around the world. And the sons and daughters of Cain call on their gods and they consult together in the center of the garden. They go to the center of the atom and they fashion a super god, the nuclear bomb. And there is an awful silence in the courts of heaven. And all our children and our children's children, born and unborn, conceived and unconceived, ask in awful silence, why? Why, when the bombs which buried me were being built, were you so silent? You who could have given life to me, why did you choose birth for the bomb and death for me. Why? And into the silence comes the voice of the Lord. And the Lord of creation calls to his people, calls to us, the sons of Abraham, the daughters of Sarah. Go! Go from where you are. Go on a journey. Leave your false security. Leave your illusions of prosperity. Leave the gods of your society. 
go on a journey, a journey of faith. I will make of you a people, a people blessing people. And the people of God are on a journey. But the journey is long and the road is barren. Where is the promise? When will peace be born? And the Lord comes and says, People of God, you are pregnant. You are pregnant with a promise of peace. But the journey is long and the road is barren. And the people of God become discouraged. And the people of God laugh their cynical laugh. And in our unfaith, we embrace the gods of our society. We take to ourselves the gods of Mammon and Mars. And our children are born sons of the gun. Our children are born daughters of the bomb. And again the messenger comes. You, you are pregnant, people of God. You are pregnant with a promise of peace. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. The promise is born. And the promise is almost killed. Hold on, children of Abraham. I do not desire the sacrificing of children. Cease the sacrificing of your children for the gods of affluence and defense. But the children of Abraham soon forget. And the people of God become slaves in Egypt and Asia and Africa and Latin America and around the world. The people of God in America become prosperous. In the courts of Pharaoh they prosper, building pyramids, split-level, tri-level, pentagonic pyramids, pyramids drawn from the blood and built on the backs of their brothers and sisters around the world. And the messenger of the Lord comes to them in a burning conviction, a fire that will not be consumed. And the people of God are saying, we will stop and see why this flame will not go out. And the Lord calls to them out of the flame, people of God, people of God. And they say, here we are. The Lord says, take your shoes off. Take your shoes off and stop running. You are on holy ground. I am the God of your fathers and mothers, the God of Abraham and Sarah and Moses and the prophets and Jesus and Francis and Gandhi and Teresa. I have seen the affliction of people in bondage. I know their sufferings. I have come to deliver them. Come, I will send you to rulers and oppressive structures that you may bring the people out of bondage. People of God are saying, Oh Lord, they won't listen to us. Oh Lord, we are not eloquent people. Oh Lord, send someone else. And the enslaved people of God wait for the prosperous people of God. Wait for us to take off our shoes. Wait for us to stop running. Wait for us to go to Pharaoh. Wait for us to say, thus says the Lord, let my people go. In the 35th year after Hiroshima died, when the plague was stored in silos around the world. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And I trembled. The foundations of my life were shaking to the core. And I said, woe is me, I am lost. I am a man of bloody hands and I live in the midst of a people of bloody hands. For 
my eyes have seen the Lord, the creator of life. And then the, re the amazing reality of the grace of God filled my being. And the voice of the Lord said to me, You, you have been touched by my love. Your guilt is gone, your sin forgiven. And the Lord said to me, Whom shall I send? Who will go with the good news of life and love? And I said, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and say to this people, Hear and hear, but do not understand. See and see, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people fat and their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed and beat their swords into plowshares. The people of God are slow to hear. The people of God become captive in Babylon. And in those days, Pentagon, king of Babylon, made a huge image of steel whose arms reached around the world. And each year, King Pentagon sent his heralds to Congress, establishing a decree that all the people should bow down before the image and offer up their sacrifices of checks and money orders. You are required, O oh people, to fall down and worship the steel image of Pentagon. Each year on or before April 15, the Internal Revenue Service will receive your offerings. Whoever does not fall down and worship shall be prosecuted. At that time, some people covenanted together not to worship the image of steel. They were brought before the king. Is it true, O people, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of steel which we have set up around the world? Now, if you obey the summons and fall down and worship, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall be prosecuted and who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And the people answered, O Pentagon, we have no need to answer you on this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we worship, is able to deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the steel image you have set up. Unto us a child is born, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Sign for you you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men. And in that region, a revised version of the same story. There were peasants out in the fields, planting rice in their paddies by day. And an American plane appeared to them, and bombs from the plane dropped around them, and they were filled with fear. This is Christmas 1972. And the message from the plane said to them, Be afraid, for behold, I bring you bad news of a great destruction, which shall come to all the people, for to you is come this day in all your cities our Savior, which is bombs and more bombs. And this will be a sign to you. You will find those bombs dropped from planes high in the sky and exploding in your villages. 
And suddenly there was with the plain a multitude of the heavenly horrors blaspheming God and saying, To hell with God and the highest, and on earth war and death to men. And the question we face is which of these stories we will choose. Both are powerful stories. One is the story of vulnerability, the story of nonviolence, the story of the power of truth and love and willingness to suffer for the sake of love. The other is the story of the power of violence the power of manipulation and control and willingness to kill. I saw apocalypse now. Balls of fire rolling from the bowels of the earth, mushrooming into the heavens. And I saw the ship of civilization snaking its way down the river of hell with many voices shouting, Apocalypse now, apocalypse now, destroy to save, kill for peace. And I saw a lamb. And I heard the word, I am the way the truth and the life. Amen. And I will welcome some of your reflections, comments, questions, and some of your perspectives.